Well, it's a, it's a big, big week for news in Seattle. I'm from Seattle. I was born in Seattle. Lots of huge news. Um, if you're tracking Seattle, a lot of it, most all of it, you couldn't. There's one piece of news. There's one piece of news that is uh, particular, uh, particularly pertinent to Christendom, and that is uh, Mark Driscoll, uh, founding pastor of Mars Hill Church in Seattle, where I grew up. He resigned this week. If if that's news to you, it's true. I, I found it rather shocking. You know, I, I, as a as a comments, I I did not. I haven't been tracking. The stories that closely over the last several months as, as people have been really upset with him over, over, um, over this last season of time. But I do want to make a few comments now that he, Mark's resigned, specifically comments flowing right out of Mark's resignation letter because there's things about this story of Driscoll and, and, and what's happened with him that I see shadows of, at least, in our passage today that we're talking about. But first of all, before I say anything else about Mark, I want to say a massive public thank you to, to Mark Driscoll, because what I learned growing up in Seattle is that one great Bible preaching church can change a city. I learned that growing up in Seattle. I saw that take place in two different generations. One great Bible preaching gospel church can have a regional impact in a city and beyond. In my parents' generation, the, the pastor's name was Bob Moorhead. He started out knocking on doors, telling people about Jesus. And, and, and from there, this church grew and, and he kept love Jesus. He also championed planting other churches that love Jesus and stayed true to the gospel and clear on the gospel, Bible gospel churches. And, and his church grew to, to large proportions until there was a great collapse and uh, some allegations came out and he ended up resigning and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, a, a dark time, but, but in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, Bob Moorhead, just his, his church and the impact of that simple, powerful gospel preaching impacted the whole city. Now... Uh, after, his, after, his, after he left my peers, my generation, leaving the churches in droves, completely in Seattle, there's just massive exodus of my generation, massive, massive exodus, and then God ra uh, rose up, raised up, raised it up, I don't know, whatever you say, rose up, uh, Mark Driscoll, and Mark stood in the gap of a massive generational exodus in Seattle in those early days. And people did not, people stopped leaving the churches and started listening to this new Bible preacher. This, this, this guy, bit of a punk, but, uh, but a, 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 Bible, a Bible teacher, Mark. Uh, when young Kelly Ingraham and Brian Ingraham, that's my wife and I, when, when we were working in Seattle, there was times where we just needed some refreshing and we'd make the trek across the bridge into Seattle, listen to Mark preach and, and be uh, be refreshed. I'm no, I'm no Mark Driscoll, but I'm supremely thankful for his preaching, which um, encouraged me in those early days and, sh and continued to show me that Bob Moorhead wasn't just an anomaly, but that uh, solid Bible preaching and gospel preaching uh, in, in even one single church can impact a whole city for Jesus. I, I'm so thankful. Secondly, I, I want to say about Mark, I want to say a massive thank you to his wife and his kids. I mean, for 18 years, they have been publicly, they have been harassed from all sides. They have been, there's been threats on their, their kids and, the, and their lives and his wife. And it's, it's just evil, evil stuff it, it has been directed to this family. I don't know if you've noticed, but Mark has been controversial at times uh, throughout the years. Uh, I can't imagine that the trauma and the intensity of the pain that this family's had to live through. I am thankful for Grace, and was his wife's name, and, um, and their kids. And I wish them just a great season of refreshing, please refreshing, of healing from, from all, all this, this stuff that's gone on. My third comment out of four is thirdly, I am so thankful. And I was talking to my sister last night. My sister's in Seattle, and, and uh, may, maybe many of you know her. She lived here for a couple years. But my sister and I were talking and uh, just how thankful we are that of the accusations that didn't come against Mark. 
that he was never accused of, of sexual impropriety or sexual morality. So thankful for that. He was never accused of anything illegal. So thankful for that as well. Uh, he was never accused of, of um, heresy or turning away from the gospel. I, Sarah and I are both. We grew up in Seattle. We know, we know the trauma that that city's been through. And we're thankful that those three things didn't um, blast Seattle one more time. So thankful that no matter what the accusations, no matter what the enemy tried to do in Mark's life, that, that those accusations did not come against him and, and didn't hold any water. Uh, fourthly, and finally, I do want to comment about the accusations of spiritual arrogance and its fruit. And, and I, these are words right from Mark's resignation letter, Mark's own words himself. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm just saying what Mark himself writes about. He writes about his pride issues, spiritual pride issues. He writes about his anger, his anger issues. He writes about his domineering spirit. Uh, he also confesses at different points about his um, decision-making, shady decision-making. Not illegal, but definitely not uh, entirely above board decision-making. He's, he's confessed that a lot over the years. Uh, things that all come back to issues of spiritual pride and, and character issues. And I'm not heaping anything at Mark. Mark, will Mark says, calls it out. He says pride. He, he'll say it himself. But friends, when I, when I look at Mark and, and, and kind of where he's been at and, and being a little bit aware of his story, at least in the early years, not so much in the last 11 years since I've been away from Seattle, but I see here a good, important, a great important warning for us. For me and, and just for, for all of our generation, the, the, the importance of living pure and never letting that, a, a root of that accusation of, of impurity to come against you and to come against your life. Living pure, living legal, not breaking the law, not, 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 not cutting cords, uh, not twisting the Bible's teachings to, to what you want it to say or, or whatever your background, whatever churches you grew up in. You, we, uh, there's different theologies represented all over this room. Whatever you grew up in, and not closing your mind off to the scriptures based on the church teachings that you were raised in and just going back to the Bible and saying, what does it actually say? What does it actually say? Keeping that, that, that soft heart to, to the gospel. Uh, but the other thing I, I would want to encourage us is remember the whole warning about character, friends. Character. Character. Care, pride. Be warned about pride. Be warned about all the faces of pride. There's so many sneaky faces and facets of, of pride. And, and, and don't let it Remain. Don't let it continue its work in your life. Fight against spiritual pride and arrogance. Maybe it surfaces in anger. Maybe you're like, anger in my life, but it's, it's, it's righteous anger because I kick cats and cats are evil. I don't know. I, I, whatever, whatever the case may be, I, don't kick cats. Anyways, are you prone? Maybe you're prone to asking what's the fastest way to success as opposed to what's the most holy way forward. Just things like that. Where is, where do you see pride at work? I, I, some say pride is at the heart of all sin. Uh, they say that, that, that Satan fell because pride, pride in his heart I, as well. He uses the same motivation in our lives, pride. Do you see pride at work in your life? It's there. Do you see it at work? I'm not saying it's successful. Or I'm just saying it's present. That it, it's trying to have its work. I definitely see it in my life. Friends, un, unaddressed pride. Unaddressed pride and its fruit have a way of ruining good things. Unaddressed pride has a, a way of ruining good relationships, good churches, good friendships. Uh, just good things in general. One of the pride areas in my life that I see very frequently is I do not like to appear weak or incompetent. I don't like that at all. I, 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 I want to uh, portray a mask to you all that, I, that I'm calm, cool, confident, you know, all, all that Aladdin kind of stuff. And, and I, I want to I have all that. I don't want to I want to hide any weaknesses and I want to I want to just be like, hey, I've got all now, the irony of that is obvious. Healing takes place in the light. 
Healing takes place in the light. And so if I keep my weaknesses hidden, I don't get to work on them. Because sometimes, as we all know, we need help working on the things in our lives and the broken pieces in our life. But healing takes place in the light. But if I'm trying to keep it in darkness, so it's not going to... And the irony is I keep the weaknesses and I don't get to continue to work through them towards, towards health. Yeah, healing takes place in life. I like to, I'd like to have it all together, but times like now, I don't. I don't have it all together. And uh, yeah, I, I'm just thankful for God's grace and, and for his continued work in my life. Where is pride at work in your heart? Do you see it? Do you see where it's at work, what it's trying to do? Maybe for me, it's keeping me from getting help on certain things. Uh, for others, it might be uh, giving them excuses to keep to not address issues in the life, to, to allow yourself to keep being angry. Like, that, that's okay. Or you don't have to be kind to these people. Be loving to some of the people in your life. Where, where is it giving you permission to not walk in God's holy way? Paul writes to Timothy. Paul writes to Timothy in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4. And he says this. Pay close attention to your life. Pay close attention to your life and teaching. Persevere in these things, for by doing this, persevering in your life and in your teaching, by doing this, you will save both yourself and your... Spiritual pride is one of the main tools that the enemy uses to keep us from paying close attention to our lives. And it can blind us. and It can hold up things such as... Um, you read your Bible, you, you do good, you tell people about Jesus, you go to church every week, and you, you have all these good things in your life, and so, because you have all these good things in your life, you know, this other stuff, don't worry too much about it. Don't worry too much about it. Someone might say, I'm going to be all right with this. Someone might say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ignore um, my, un, my, my workaholic nature. I'm going to ignore my just general, I'm just kind of a jerk. I'm going to ignore that, I'm gonna, my unkindness or whatever. When I know God calls me to be loving and kind, full of his heart of compassion. Anyways, you, you get it. Today we're going to be looking at a king famous. Famous for being a great, godly, successful king who ends up crashing and burning due to spiritual pride issues. If you're new or you're visiting, we are in a study of 13 lessons from 10 kings from the second half of the book of Second Chronicles. Very exciting. Uh, we are looking at kings who are all in the bloodline of King David because they, there was a promise made to David that, that one of his descendants is going to be the king, the king, who will reign forever and ever. We know that king is Jesus, who will reign for, forever and ever. We know that so out of his descendants is this royal king going to be born. Second Chronicles, we see these, these kings in his bloodline that aren't yet Jesus. Many of them are listed in Matthew chapter 1, including the guy we're talking about today. And so we're getting to this guy today named Uzziah. And you can see, find his story in, the, in Second Chronicles chapter 26. And we're going to get to know this guy, uh, the second most successful king in all of Judah's history. If, if this name Uzziah or Uzziah or Uzziah, whatever... Uh, Uzziah, if, if that name is ringing a bell, that's probably because you're familiar with Isaiah chapter 6, in which begins, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, right? That, that, you, that might be ringing a bell from there. Anyway, 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Let's get, to, let's get to know this guy for a second. Chapter 26, starting in verse 1, okay, here's, here's what the Word of God says. It says, all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in place of his father, Amaziah. He rebuilt Eloth, restored it to Judah after Amaziah the king rested with his fathers. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king, and he reigned 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah from Jerusalem. He did what was right in Yahweh's sight, in, right in the Lord's sight, as his father Amaziah had done. He sought God throughout the lifetime of Zechariah, the teacher of the fear of God. During the time that he sought Yahweh, sought the Lord, God gave him success. Uh, just a few quick brief notes about Uzziah here in the internet. 52 years is a long time as king. However, we know that for 24 of his, his first 24 years, 
co-regent, co-king with his father. The last 11 years, because of health issues, which we're going to get to in a moment, he is co-king with his, his son. His son actually the, the kingdom. He's technically king, but his son has to take care of everything because of his illness issues. Only 17 of those years, he's, he's king by himself. But another thing that I want to highlight goes back to our lessons two weeks ago. Remember what we talked about two weeks ago? Of course we do. We listen to everything you ever say. Yes, thank you. Uh, so we talked about spiritual discipleship. We talked about spiritual mentors. We talked about King Josiah for as long as, what was the guy's name? Jehoiada, right? As long as Jehoiada was alive, he followed God. But once he died, again, we see that same lesson here. Did you pick that up in verse 5 here? It's, it talks about King Uzziah, and it said in verse 5, he sought God throughout the lifetime of Zechariah. So you just keep seeing this little lesson, this little encouragement. Who are those godly people in your life that are, you're allowing to pour into you? As, throughout the, life of the, the lifetime of Zechariah, the teacher of the fear of God. Yeah, so just like in our study of Josh, we've got, this, we've got this disciple and this king who's following God as long as he has this godly mentor in his life. But there's an interesting inter, um, addition, uh, an interesting ad, insight, I suppose, into how this king is being discipled. In what it is about God that he's being mentored in, that, that a, a lesson that he is being bombarded with, that as long as he holds this truth or this lesson in front of his face, as long as he keeps this, I, these ideas fresh in his mind, he is able to navigate and hold on to a vast amount of success without becoming arrogant. Because of one truth. And, it, and it, you get this idea when you, when you see about Zechariah, his mentor, it says, I quote, that he was the teacher of the fear of God. The teacher of the fear of God. Pretty cool title, huh? Hey, you know that guy? He's the teacher of the fear of God. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Anyway, so I, I don't want to give the story away, but Uzziah is going to become spiritually arrogant later. But one of the great antidotes that holds spiritual arrogance in check in Uzziah's life for years and years and years is living with a strong saturation of this idea of the fear of the Lord. If you're taking notes today, number one, living with a strong and fresh. It's not just knowing it, but keeping it fresh. A strong and fresh grasp of the fear of God, the fear of the Lord, can protect you from the enticement of spiritual arrogance. Now, just so we're clear here, there's a good and right fear of God, and there is a wrong fear of God, okay? If you're taking notes, A, wrong fear of the Lord is when you are afraid God is lying to you in some way, all right? So, for instance, even though you love Jesus, even though you've dedicated your life to Jesus, even though you have the Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians chapter 1, the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our salvation, says Ephesians chapter 1, even though you have that in your life, you were afraid that someday you're going to stand before God and you're not going to be accepted because he's going re to reject you for something that you've done. Even though God has been clear that your salvation has been guaranteed through Jesus of Nazareth. You're guaranteed. He's going to reject it. There, there, that would be a wrong fear of God, that God's going to reject your A wrong fear of God would be, God, you're going to be afraid that God, even though he tells you he loves you. Even though every week I tell you that your God loves you. The God of the Bible loves you. I, I, I want you to know that. I want you to know it every week. Oh, I know it. Okay. So even though... Even though your God loves you, or God of the Bible loves you, he cares for you, even though he's paying attention to you, wrong fear of the Lord is afraid that he doesn't actually love you. That would not be a good fear of the Lord. That the wrong fear of the Lord would be that God doesn't care about me. If you, if you think God doesn't care about me, you're calling God a liar. He says he cares about you. A wrong fear of the Lord, God's not paying attention to me. He's not, he doesn't, he's not paying attention right now. That would be a, a, wrong, a wrong fear of the Lord sort of thing, that he's not good. He's not overflowing with love and, and compassion to me. A right fear of the Lord, the Bible says a right fear of the Lord, according to Exodus chapter 20, is to keep us from sinning. 
It's to keep us from evil. The, the right fear of the Lord keeps us from, from sinning. A very clear New Testament idea as well. In Acts chapter 9, verse 31, you, you see that the, it says, The church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace, being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord. This is not an Old Testament thing only. This is a Bible thing. Walking in the fear of the Lord. That's the church. And in the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. An increase in numbers. That's a message right there. Those two things. Walking in the fear of the Lord. And, and living in the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. Also you can read like in verses like in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. Therefore it says, dear friends. Since we, if you get annoyed that I call you friends. I've been kind of pulling that out recently, kind of getting used to it, and, uh, and, and I, I like it. And you're like, you're, we're not friends. Well, just, I'm following the Bible. What are you following? <laughs> oh, man. I didn't know I was following the Bible, to be fair. I just was, I was just having a good time there. Anyways, I would like to delete that. Anyways, so, <laughs> therefore, dear friends, since we have such promises, sorry, I'll save can, that Take that conviction out. I want to save my conviction for the Holy Spirit conviction. Since we have such promises, oh my goodness, let's go back to this. Uh, this is the fear of God, fear of God piece here, which is supposed to be keeping us from sinning. Keep us, let us cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh and spirit. Okay, that's the getting turning away from sin let us cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh and spirit completing our sanctification in the fear of god the fear of god the good fear of god is connected to cleansing or moving away from sin moving away from sin and temptation and moving towards holiness and 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 uh with great humility if you're taking notes be Right fear of the Lord motivates holy living and great humility. Holy living motivates holy living and great humility. The, the, concept, the concept of living with right fear of the Lord is so important, probably so that we don't get confused in, because we live in such incredible grace. We live in an environment and a context of total, complete, wonderful, glorious, at least for me, entirely needed grace. And it might be demotivating because grace is so amazing to work on some of the issues because we have so much grace and, and not actually push ourselves in some of those character issues. But the fear of the Lord is one of those things, including the love of loving God with all our hearts that we're commissioned to. But fear of the Lord is another thing that is, is there to keep us motivated. Right fear of God it helps us understand uh, and be, keep focus on God's perfect holiness. His holiness is perfect, and that also reminds us that God cannot abide with even a tiny bit of unholiness he's holy 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 there is he's not able to tolerate he does not tolerate he cannot abide even the shadow a shadow of darkness all right so there, there are certain things in the bible when you start combining them together you start to get a little bit of a motivating picture when you talk about god's purity and his holiness and his 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 inability to tolerate being in, in, in evil and this idea that he loves you and that he cares for you and he is paying attention and he ha loves to help those who walk in his ways. He disciplines those he loves and he, he hinders those who walk away from him. You start combining these, these ideas, these Bible concepts together and you start thinking, okay, God is not ignoring me. God is not ignoring me. He knows how I'm living. He knows how I'm thinking. And because he loves me, he's not ignoring that evil. He's not ignoring that. And at the same time, he's bur he burns with total holiness. And, 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 I, and I fall dreadfully short of that holiness. I, I fall so short of the holiness of God in, in, my, in my being and in my, my mind. And, and that, that idea is supposed to humble us. It's not supposed to fill us with, with, with uh, depression. It's supposed to humble us and motivate us, according to, to Paul, to cleanse ourselves, that said our verse, from every impurity of the flesh and the spirit. 
The more you keep in front of your mind and to keep fresh in your mind this understanding of how holy our God is and how much this holy God loves you and cares about you and how vast the difference is between the holiness of God and, and our current reality, it's supposed to be humbling. It's supposed to be humbling and we, we don't panic. We know that God's not going to reject us because of his promises. We, we know that God's not going to reject us because of his grace. In fact, grace becomes more wonderful the more you focus on the fear of God. The more you keep in fresh in your mind how vastly different and far away God's holiness is to my reality, me, Brian Ingraham's reality, the more, it's just the more I can just think about grace and be like, wow, wow, what, what grace. We need to get back to our story here, but I want you to hold on to this. Because as long as Uzziah holds on to this idea of the fear of the Lord and keeps it fresh in his life, and he has that guy reminding him of it all the time, as long as he has that, he's able to handle vast amount of success. And by success, this is the kind of stuff he's experiencing in verse 6. It says this, it says, Uzziah went out to wage war against the Philistines, and he tore down the wall of Gath, the wall of Javna, the wall of Ashdod, which is just fun right? Tearing down, tearing down walls. Then he built cities in the vicinity of Ashdod and among the Philistines, saying, you know, hey, hey, you can't keep it. I don't know, whatever he was saying. And number seven, God helped him against the Philistines, the Arabs that lived in Gerbil. 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 And the Meunites, selfish people. The Ammonites gave Uzziah tribute money. And his fame spread far, as far as the entrance of Egypt. God made him very powerful. And it just keeps on going about his success and all this different, what he built and, and soil sowing and, and, and his armies and warriors and just all this kind of stuff. And you get down to this list and list and verses until you get down to verse 15. It's just continuing to go. And it says, he made skillfully designed devices in Jerusalem to shoot arrows and catapult large stones for use on the towers and on the corners. So his fame spread even to distant places for he was marvelously helped. He was marvelously helped until he became strong. Uzziah, he, he is the most famous, the most successful, the most innovative, the most rich, the respected, strongest king to ever lead this tiny nation called Judah, the southern kingdom thus far. His fame is spreading all over the place. Why is he successful according to verse 15? Because, and I love these words, he was marvelously helped. Marvelously. I love, what a wonderful word to just say out loud. Somebody, one of my friends asked me this morning, well, how are you feeling today? I said, marvelous. I just, it's just a word for life. Uh, anyway, so marvelously helped by God. He's entirely successful, steeped in this teaching about the fear of God, allows him to stay humble with his unprecedented success. But then things change. Zechariah is no longer in the picture, and you have this guy bursting with God-blessedness, with vast amount of success and fame, who then tragically loses sight. He doesn't forget about the fear of God, but the freshness fades. And the, the focus changes. And what happens, verse 16... But when he became strong, he grew arrogant, and it led to his own destruction. When he became strong, he grew arrogant, and it led to destruction. Can you hear the warning? Can you hear the warning? When he became strong, he grew proud to his destruction. Again, these words are written down according to 2 Chronicles chapter 10, verse 11. 2 Chronicles 10, 11, that's like a theme for all Old Testament study, which says it's, these things are written down as warnings for us, Christians who would come later, who would give their lives to Jesus. This, these Old Testaments are written down as warnings for us. When you are successful and strong, and you take your eyes off of the holy God who loves you and who is you. When you take your eyes off God, the only way forward for you, friend, is going to be down. God makes it so clear over and over in the Bible. 
What does Proverbs 11.2 say? Proverbs 11.2 says, when pride comes, disgrace follows. When pride comes, disgrace follows, but with humility comes wisdom. Hear the wisdom of Proverbs. I, I, there's so many passages that talk about humility and the superiority of humility and the warning against pride. You can look at Micah 6, 8, one verse that's always fresh in my mind. Mankind, God has told you what is good and what the Lord requires of you. Act justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly. Walk humbly. Walk humbly. Walk humbly with your God. With your God. Psalm 25, 9, God leads the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. How about the New Testament? Philippians chapter 2, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others more important than yourselves. James chapter 4, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. James chapter 4, verse 6, quoting from Proverbs, I believe it's Proverbs chapter 3, God resists the proud. But gives grace to the humble. That would be a glorious life verse, friend. God resists the proud. Grace to the humble. What, what, what wisdom, what guidance for life. I mean, I can you go on and on. There's so many verses on this kind of stuff. But what, because what wars in your soul is between pride and and holy humility. There's an unholy humility. I'm not going to get into that. But between pride and humility, God knows this. The scripture keeps reminding of this. You actually yourself know this, and the enemy wants you to ignore this. To ignore this, this presence of pride and not worry about it, and it hurts. The enemy wants you to think pride, although it may not be the best, isn't the worst of all things. And The only way that he can keep that lie in your mind is by keeping you from focusing on the great distance between your reality and the reality of the Almighty, the Holy One, the Holy, Holy, Holy One, which humbles us and causes us to worship as we appreciate God's great grace and the grace we have in Jesus, motivates us to live in good fear of the one who loves us and either helps or hinders. So what happens with Uzziah? Where does this spiritual pride take him? <clears throat> um, bad places, but I'll, I'll let you see here. Verse 16. But when he, had become, when he became strong, he grew arrogant, and it led to his own destruction. He acted unfaithfully against Yahweh, his God. By going into Yahweh's sanctuary, to the Lord's sanctuary, to burn incense on the incense altar. Azariah the priest, along with 80 brave priests of Yahweh of the Lord, went in after him. They took their stand against King Uzziah and said, Uzziah, you have no right to offer incense to the Lord. Only, and they're just referring to the Bible, only the consecrated priests, the descendants of Aaron, have the right to offer incense. Leave the sanctuary, for you have acted unfaithfully. You will not receive honor from Yahweh God, from the Lord God. Uzziah, with a fire pan in his hand to offer incense, was enraged. If you ever feel your heart enraged, one of the motives can be pride. I'm not saying it's always the motive, but it, one of them can be. His heart was, he was enraged. But when he became enraged with the priests in the presence of the priests in Yahweh's temple, beside the altar of incense, a skin disease broke out on his forehead. Then Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests turned to him and saw that he was diseased on his forehead. They rushed him out of there. He himself also hurried to get out because Yahweh, the Lord, had inflicted him. You can't have a skin disease and be in Yahweh's temple. That's... That's, that's, no. So King Uzziah was diseased to the death. He lived in quarantine with a serious skin disease and was excluded from access to Yahweh's temple while his son Jotham was over the king's health, uh, household governing the people of the land. Spiritual pride. In King Uzziah's place, it's like, you can't tell me what to do. I am king. I am, I am king. I am going to do what I want to do. I don't want you telling me what to do. And you are priests, but I am the king. And so I don't want you. I want to make an offering. 
And I'm, king. I'm God's king. I, I, God knows me. He loves me. He has a wonderful plan for my life. Whatever the case may be. God is aware of, of who I am. I'm the king. You can't tell me what to do. In, in Uzziah's case, though, he's not actually fighting against the priest. The priests are saying, you can't do this. But he's not actually fighting against a priest. What's he fighting against? The Bible. He's fighting against, it feels like he's fighting against the priests. But actually, the priests are just saying, this is what the Bible says. You can't do this. He's like, but I want to do this. Number two, spiritual pride elevates how we think things should be over what God says things should be in the Bible. Spiritual pride elevates how we think things should be over what God says things should be in the Bible. And this can be in our character. You know, I don't, I don't need to love that person. I can give you 5,000 reasons I don't need to love them as long as I don't look in the Bible. Ooh, that came out a little bit convicting. Sorry about that. Uh, I don't need to forgive that person. I've got a list of reasons why I don't need to forgive that person. Oh, the Bible says love. The Bible says forgive everyone of everything. No. Okay. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe spiritual pride, it, it can be also that straight rejection of of simple Bible instruction. What Uzziah does here is he rejects the words of the Bible when it comes to God's temple because it's not how he wants it to be. He doesn't like it. He doesn't approve of it. He thinks it should be different. He is the king. He should be able to do this. In his mind, he should be able to do this. Do we ever do this with the Bible? Do we ever raise our opinions of how we think sh things should be over what the Bible says, discounting and shoving aside what the Bible says, because that's not what we want it to say or what we think it should say? Well, I've got some examples. <laughs> now I'm going to say something that some of you won't like. All right. And... Uh, it may bother some of you so much you will never come back to this church again. <laughs> All right. I, I get that. Um, when I started with those words this morning, my wife just about freaked out. She's like, what are you going to say? Her mind started spinning. But I'm going to push on a common spiritual button that shows up on our generation all the time. And I just want to encourage you to spiritual humility here. It's not that big of a deal. I have intentionally chosen this concept just to push on your buttons a little bit. It won't push on everybody's button, but just, just some people's buttons. So take a breath. A common way that I see spiritual pride crop up in a way that causes rejection to the written word of God pertains to the concept of women elders. Women eldership. Women as elders. Just wait for some of your blood to stop boiling. Women elders. Oh, the, the outcry. Male only eldership. It's wrong. It's outdated. It's, it's demeaning of women. It's used to push women down. It's sexist. It's discriminatory. It's an example of male dominance. Whatever the outcry. Look at the Bible. Just look at the Bible. It has a lot to say about eldership. What does it say? Read it. Don't whinge it, the preacher. Look at the book. What does it say? You will not find a single verse in all of the scriptures that points to or talks about examples of women elders or even implies that it's a good or right or a, 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 a something that God wants. You won't see a hint of it in the scriptures. It's all male only. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. Really? Okay. Be very careful. This is just as a friend here. Be very careful with those concepts. Be very careful throwing the phrase, that's wrong at the Bible. Okay? Be very, very careful. Take the path of spiritual humility as we, as we look at the word of the one. I believe the one who made the church, the one who bought the church, his own blood, has 
the authority to tell us how he wants it to go and, and, and how he wants it to be led and by whom he wants. Now, I intentionally picked this topic to push somebody's buttons just for fun. But the point is, anytime we stand against God's word and we're wrong, or we don't like what it says, so we say, outdated, it's, it's, it's terrible. Spiritual pride is right there. That's spiritual pride. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about with Uzziah. That's what Uzziah does. And that is, you tell me, say, like, that, that's not how I want it. That's not how I think I should reject that. And, and it's so dangerous. Oh, please, please never call anything, any direction of God in the Bible evil or wrong. It's just so, so dangerous. So dangerous to do that. What is so hard about humbling ourselves before the word of God and just its simple instructions and directions? Letting God tell us how he wants things to be done and letting him make those calls without fighting him and saying, that's wrong, that's wrong. Look, we all battle with spiritual pride stuff. We all have it in our life. I do. I do all the time. The, the, the answer is incredible humility, though. The growth of it. And one of the great helps for maintaining humility is staying fresh and focused on a good and right fear of God and understanding just how holy he is. Spiritual pride is a sneaky, sneaky thing that rises its ugly head, especially when we taste success. And we, we taste success, and, we, we, uh, and we, then we can start justifying compromises in our lives and how we reject some of the Bible's teachings that we don't like. Anyways, just Jesus, on the other hand, models humility. Glorious, glorious humility. Jesus rejects pride. The Bible says that he humbles himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Remember, there's a moment where Jesus doesn't really like the Bible words that this, the, the Messiah will suffer and die. Okay? Father, is there any other way? Do we have a plan B? No. But he humbles himself and he goes with the scriptures, goes with the will of God. So the scripture, and he humbles and he says, why did he have to die? Well, because the distance between God's holiness and our reality is so vast. And because this holy, holy, holy God cannot abide with even the tiniest shadow of unholiness. And there is a problem there because you may look at your life and I've, I've got some holy bits there and some unholy parts there. And, and you know, I've got more holy than unholy or whatever delusion you tell yourself. And you, but anyways, you've got, you, you've, got these, you've got some holiness and some unholiness there. And you, you're, you're, you're like, whatever, if you go to stand before the holy, holy, holy God who can't abide with the, even the tiniest bit of holiness and you've got even the smallest bit of unholiness their answer is expulsion from the presence of god forever he cannot abide with you because of that that unholiness there okay you only have one hope on that day friends jesus jesus and what happens is jesus is is crucified and so that your situation gets placed on the cross and Jesus' perfection, his holy, holy, holiness gets put on you, on your account. And that's the only way, taking Jesus' holiness on yourself is the only way you can be in the presence of God forever on that final day. That's, that's what you need. If you've not given your life to Jesus, you need to do that. That's your only hope. There is salvation through no one else. Jesus of Nazareth got three challenges for you. Challenge number one, I want you to read Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, and just uh, imagine yourself standing there in the presence of this holy, holy, holy God. Isaiah goes through the full gamut of emotions in those eight verses, realizing that he is an unholy person, is in the holy, holy presence of God, and, and how God deals with that, and how G Jesus is, is the one who deals with that in our account. Just go through that. Uh, challenge number two, what four unholy attributes have you allowed to remain active in your life that you haven't, in the words of Paul, been cleansing yourself of? Uh, that relatively unchallenged or even justified, you know, anger issues, unkindness, impurity issues, greed, you're even working on whatever the case. Uh, four things, just repent and turn from those. And number three, one of the easiest challenges of all time, 
Memorize James 4, 6. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I think you can do that. I think you can do that. Hey friends, it's been a few days since I taught this message that, that you just watched. And I've gotten some feedback, as you, as you might guess, particularly with my comments pertaining to women and eldership. And I was very intentional about pushing a button there, but it's come to my attention that I, I pushed a button for some that was a different button than I actually intended to push. When I spoke about women as not being elders in, in the Bible, what some people heard uh, was women uh, not able to be leaders at the highest uh, levels, at the highest levels, and that men should be the highest leaders. And, and I just want to make a few comments about that because that, that's not even what I actually believe. Uh, and so just to, just to clarify, it's true that in a local church, elders are the highest level of leadership. That they're, they're, the, they're the highest level of leadership, and, and the Bible makes it clear that those should be for for men only, but I want to remind you what's very clear in the New Testament and in the scriptures, that elders aren't necessarily the highest level of leadership in Jesus' kingdom. And you see uh, higher levels such as apostles and prophets. In fact, it, they're, they're the foundation, they're, they're foundation pillars there. So you have the, the apostles and prophets as higher level things, and I would just ask you, can you think of of any uh, any levels, any people, any women in those higher levels of leadership that would be higher in leadership um, level, I guess, than elders, elders at a local church, and maybe apostles. I don't want to get into a study of what is it, Romans sixteen, maybe nine or ten or something like that, and all this kind of stuff. Maybe potentially there is a, a woman apostle mentioned there. Uh, whether it is or whether it isn't, you definitely see uh, women prophets in the Bible. And you, in both the Old and the New Testament, you see Philip's daughters. You see, for instance, Deborah in the Old Testament. And, and even a, in a, a conservative reading of the idea of the, the church being built on the leadership and the, the teaching and the, the, uh, the pillars of apostles and prophets, even if you think of apostles as the New Testament and referring to the Old Testament prophets, you still have Deborah there, a, a woman role, and, and it's God, Jesus himself, who, get, who appoints who's apostles and, and prophets. And so I, I just wanted to, to throw that out there so that you didn't mis, misunderstand maybe my heart or what I'm saying about leadership. I, I very much want to follow the scriptures and pertains to that specific role of, of eldership. Uh, but personally, I do view there to be higher levels of leadership than elders in Jesus' kingdom. And I do see, at least in the role of, of prophets, uh, women in those roles. So, so as, you, as you kind of uh, continue to process what I've, been what I've taught about, specifically the role of eldership, um, do keep in mind that, that um, I, I, I do believe that it should be for for men only and, and I see that in the scriptures like I said before but that is not the same discussion as men should be in the high levels of leadership and women should not be in the high levels of leadership so uh, I just want to bring a little bit of uh, clarification there uh, and, and I hope that's helpful I hope that's helpful I, I understand I'm not sure which recording is going to be used but but some people were were agitated at uh uh, that I came across um, proud and, and a bit like a punk. And, and, and if, if you perceived me that way, um, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I definitely uh, want to uh, be loving, and, and I definitely think I, I could have been too much of a punk. I was probably too much of a punk in, in that particular moment as I tried to make that point. Uh, I want to continue to grow as a pastor, and I want to continue to grow in, in humility, and I, and I I, ideally, I want to be loving in, in how I came across. I don't believe I was as loving as I ought to be, and, and so I, I want to apologize for that. Um, but uh, boy, that was fun. <laughs> Thanks for your feedback, everyone, and I, and I hope that um, this is helpful for those who listen to this message in the future. Thank you.